This episode is sponsored by Mel Science. Click the button below and get your 25% discount for the first month with Mel Chemistry. Mel Chemistry is an awesome subscription for safe experiments to do with kids and parents at home. Mel Chemistry is a perfect solution for homeschoolers, a great alternative to a school laboratory, perfect for those who care about their kids' development, and it can give kids a great head start because Mel Chemistry is for the parents who desire the best for their kids. So if you want some productive time spent with your family, Mel is a perfect activity for all kids and parents who love crafting. It provides good education, and not to mention the experiments are safe to do at home, fascinating, and fun. Mel Chemistry includes a free VR headset that works with most phones, and free exciting VR lessons as well. With Mel Science, learning isn't boring. Click the button below and get your 25% discount for the first month with Mel Chemistry. Code HTME, and be sure to stick around until the end of the video for the Mel Chemistry giveaways. So far now I've shown a few different ways to source copper, probably the most difficult ways possible by going out and finding the ore yourself, bringing it back, processing it, and extracting the ore into actual copper to make a weapon. Well, not having to buy the materials, it's actually really expensive when you factor in having to drive there, rent a car that can handle the rough terrains, all the electricity to grind it up, smash it up, then electro win it out. Overall, that's probably the most cost inefficient way to actually make copper. The easiest way is probably just to go out and buy a piece of copper. It's already processed, ready to go, but it's actually not the cheapest. The cheapest way is actually to melt US pennies. So pennies are made of copper, or at least they were. The penny, or its actual official name, the one cent piece, was first introduced in 1793 and was then made 100% of copper. It was nearly the size of a half dollar. With inflation, a penny then had the purchasing power as a quarter does today. Through the course of the past two centuries, the size and composition has changed to various alloying metals of copper, from nickel, tin, or zinc, or some combination of those, with a brief period during World War II where they were made of zinc-coated steel. For the majority of their existence, they have primarily been copper, usually 95%. But after 1982, they were swapped to a cheaper-to-produce copper-plated zinc penny that are used today. But even with the cheaper metals, as of 2014, a penny costs an average 1.7 cents to produce. With continued inflation and the rising value of copper, this has caused older copper coins to be worth more as a metal than their face value. Which means that if you source all of your copper from early US pennies, it's actually cheaper than just buying that copper straight. So to make the cheapest sword possible, I'm gonna try that out. And I know what you're thinking, I'm committing federal crime by destroying US currency, and that is actually not true. According to the Code of Federal Regulations, melting coins for a profit is illegal. However, there are exceptions for coins being used for educational, amusement, novelty, jewelry, and similar purposes, as long as you are obviously not profiting from the metal content of the pennies. Since making a sword could be considered almost all of these, this should in theory be completely legal, as long as I'm not trying to sell the sword or anything. Unless it is, we'll find out. I'll let you know if I go to jail. I haven't talked to a lawyer, so my next video might be from prison. We'll find out. Most coins in circulation are either going to be pre-1982, 95% copper, or post-1982, 97.5% zinc. To see the difference, copper dissolves nitric acid, so you can strip away the outer layers of the coin from each of these eras. And you'll be left with a nice clean older penny and a completely zinc newer penny. I got a giant box of $25 worth of pennies and then a bag of like $14. That gives me uh, almost 4,000 pennies to sort through. Having to sort through them manually and look for the date on each one is gonna be really, really time consuming. There are a few ways to potentially sort pennies, besides manually sorting them by the printed date. In fact, apparently penny hoarding is a thing that people do, and separate and hoard these higher value pennies, waiting for the laws about melting the penny to go away so they can melt them down and make a profit. To separate them, you can do it via weight, or you can even use the magnetic properties of copper to separate the ones that are mostly copper. Or since there's already apparently a demand for it, you can just buy a cheap machine that separates them for you. It analyzes the composition of each coin and then spits it out in either one slot or the other. So I can quickly sort through a whole bunch of coins. So copper goes on one side, zinc goes on the other. I can melt the copper ones down and then the zinc ones I can bring back to the bank in a giant bag of 2,000 some pennies. I'm sure they'll love that. It's gonna take a while.
tried to rig up a way to give the separator a constant flow of coins, but ultimately it was just easier to manually feed them by the handful. Thanks to this handy little sorter, I now have my mostly copper pennies sorted from the zinc ones. These are all pre-1982, should be like 95% copper at least. But to make bronze, you also need tin. And if I wanted to keep with the whole coin theme, tin coins are a thing. This is a Thai coin from the 1940s made out of tin. There's a few Southeast Asian countries that had tin coins. However, they are pretty rare and uh, to get enough of them would be pretty expensive and kind of a shame to melt down a bunch of collectible coins. I'm just gonna use store-bought ingots, get this mixed up, and it's gonna be about nine to one ratio of tin to copper. Next, time to cast it. Once again, with some help from Greg, the sword casting guy. But first, while on the topic of tin, a message from our sponsor, Mel Science. Click the button below and get your 25% discount for the first month with Mel Chemistry. Hey, buddy. How's the homework going? I can't find a source for tin. Mel Science sent us a few kits. Ooh, maybe we can take a study break and learn something. They sent us a VR headset. This is pretty cool. I'll, I'll let you check this one out. Well, this is amazing. I can see the copper and tin formings right in front of me. Wow, monsters, this is gonna be loads of fun for a birthday party. Cyanotype, this will come in handy for a photography series. Looks like we get to make blueprints. I wonder what else we can make. The starter kit. Be sure to use it with someone over the age of 12. Oh snap, son, look at this. They even included a tin hedgehog set. This is perfect for our penny sword. Let's get our science on. And it's already forming. Wow, what a fun day of experimenting with this tin kit. I sure learned a lot. Yeah, what an awesome day. Mel Science must really believe in how to make everything. If Mel believes in us just this much, I think we should believe in them fully too. You hear that? Now back to making the sword. Previously, I made a Bronze Age sword with the help of Greg. Don't burn your hand. He was also interested in helping me try to make a penny sword as well. This'll be fun to look down into, huh? Then added in the tin ingots. Heat it up just a little bit again. Oh, hello. Okay, four again. Thing we made extra. Okay. All right, so the extra go and pour in there. Good. Can you drink them all this kind of folks? Uh, no, that's really neat. Yeah, that's pretty stunning. And it's a nice cast. So this stuff is called flashing, yeah. and that's a very common thing to get with a two-part mold. We had our technical difficulty, which kind of exacerbated that, but most castings will have some of that. And this peacock effect here, I have just never seen it quite like that. Like, that's really cool. You got the whole shebang there. <laughs> got a whole rainbow. A penny sword. Oh my god. In the end, it took about $5 worth of pennies to cast this sword. Well, I'm so happy. That worked out great. I usually don't let them just air cool. I'd eventually just quench them in the water because I'm impatient.
I don't want to drop it on my toe. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that would hurt. A crucial step in making a bronze sword is edge hardening it. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be taking a ball peen hammer and just kind of laying it on our little improv anvil and just kind of lightly striking the edge. We want to do this in just a lot of small blows instead of big ones. Pounded mostly to the edge. We're going to sharpen it after we're done with that. You want to try some? I want to have it kind of laid down so that's kind of backing it. Mm -hmm. And then just kind of pound as close as you can. Like you're partly striking the anvil and partly hitting that, but just kind of as close to the edge as you can. You don't want it li like land any in here. Mm -hmm. Just kind of right up there. Compressing the, the metal so it's harder than? Yeah, shoving the atoms a little closer together makes it uh, significantly harder. You get the same effect when you're bending a paper clip back and forth. Um, before it uh, gets to the point where it breaks, it's getting harder and harder to make the bends uh, because you've compressed the metals at the point where that paper clip is bending. So that's work hardening also. Uh, but this is a, the way you do it with bronze. All right, we're going to save the sharpening until the last because we don't want to be handling a sharp sword when we're putting the handle on. Riveting is kind of a lost art, but you went back. 150 or 200 years ago, everyone would know how to do this because this was like how things were put together. And then finally, to put an actual edge on the sword, so you can see how well it can cut. So I have my penny sword. I spent a little bit of time sharpening it and putting an edge on it. I'm sure I could probably spend a few more hours really getting it razor sharp, but now I think it's at least good enough to actually cut something. Compared to the bronze sword I made last time with Greg, it is a little bit different color. And that's because there's a little bit of zinc in this. The pennies were 5% zinc, and then I'm sure there was a few red and zinc ones that got in there. Compositionally, this is more of what would be considered a gun metal which is what these to actually make cannons out of. It's got more of a golden color, and uh, I think it still has a pretty nice edge to it. Since I had a fair amount of coins left over, I also went and cast a few knives, and these should be approximately $1 worth of pennies, and uh, I'm gonna give these away later on this year. I'm gonna polish them off first. Thanks again to Greg for his help with the casting of this. He is a teacher of sword casting, and he travels all around the country, and uh, if you want him to come to you, just uh, send him a message. He can set something up. His website is theswordcastingguy.com. All right, let's get chopping.
slices, it dices. I'm gonna use this for all my cooking. My hot dogs! My hot dogs! If you'd like some free Mel Chemistry kits, tell us what Mel stands for. In Mel Chemistry, we'll give away three half year subscriptions to three viewers who answer this question the most creatively. Not the most correct person, but the most interesting. So instead of looking it up, tell us what you think Mel stands for. Click the button below and get your 25% discount for the first month with Mel Chemistry using the code HTME. And thanks again to Mel for sponsoring this episode. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe and check out other content we have covering a wide variety of topics. Also, if you've enjoyed these series, consider supporting us on Patreon. We are largely a fan-funded channel and depend on the support of our viewers in order to keep our series going. Thanks for watching.